Thank you. Uh, so thanks for the kind invitation. And maybe it's because I'm starting the last session. I let us all thank the organizers for arranging this session. OK, so um, I apologize for missing most of the session. And since uh, somebody just asked for suggestions, my suggestion as a local participant would be to have the meeting either away from the semester or during a weekend so that those of us who are here and have admin duties and teaching duties can participate better. Anyway, so that being said, so let me start. Uh, so I, I want to uh, talk about some recent work. Uh, it's published uh, in the European journals jointly with Philippe Nadeau, who's at Lyon. So this is a, uh, so I, I'm, I've always been interested in the ASAP and related models. So. So I'm going to talk about an, uh, uh, an exact solution of an ASAP. And this is, uh, of course, a very powerful model. And it has led to lots of insights, uh, as you can see over here on this slide. And there's several generalizations that have been solved. Uh, for example, the multi-species ASAP was solved exactly by Ferrari and Martin. And for disorder, ASAP is notoriously hard to solve, but there's a certain long-range exclusion process that I solved some time ago. But these are all one-dimensional models, and very few two-dimensional models have been solved exactly. And very few models with disorder have been solved exactly. So that's what I want to advertise. Uh, so the motivation comes from this old work of Martin Evans, considered an ASAP on the ring, where the hopping rates are disordered. So you have a ring of sight size L with n particles, and the kth particle moves forward with rate pk and backward with rate qk. And uh, pk and qk are arbitrary. Uh, I'm not setting them to anything so far. But, but because these, part, these pks and qks you think of as distinct, you give them, they each have their own character, and you might as well label them one for one. So this motivates, uh, it's a long story why it motivates, but this motivates the following process on two dimensions. So you consider a torus, uh, one side of which is length L, the other side has length N, it, which will have two kinds of particles, and we denote the first class particles by these uh, uh, filled circle, and uh, second class particles by an empty square. And we consider the space of configurations, which have this uh, following restrictions. Each row can contain exactly one first class particle. Each column contains exactly one particle, either uh, first or second class. And the row indices of the first class particles increase cyclically, increase uh, one after, I mean, sequentially in a cyclic order when you read them from left to right. So I'll show you in a picture in a second. So we'll have n first-class particles, which is the number of columns, and uh, uh, sorry, number of rows, and l minus n uh, second-class particles. So that's why it's quasi-two-dimensional because we sort of put these kind of restrictions to make them artificially uh, to make them exactly soluble. So this is what these configurations look like on a torus. Uh, so in each uh, row, you have exactly one first-class particle but you could potentially have many second class particles. Each column, which is now a this kind of circle, will have uh, exactly one particle of some type. And the cyclic increase means as you read, go from one row to the other, these positions uh, go down and uh, you know go around in this way. So the rates are the following. Um, uh, so whenever a second class particle Oh, sorry, whenever a first class particle is not followed by a second class, uh, by a first class particle on the next row, it will hop to the right. If the second class particle is in another column, they will just exchange positions. Uh, they're not exchange positions, exchange rows. Uh, sorry, exchange columns. Sorry, I keep getting confused. So I hope the diagram illustrates what I mean. This first class particle moves forward, and the second class particle moves backward with rate pk. On the other hand, if that first class particle is followed by the second class particle on the same row, then something more non-trivial happens. This second class particle will go and sit next to the previous first class particle, and all the second class particles in between will shift rightwards. 
including and also uh, and so does the first class part. So it's a bit complicated, but uh, uh, with the same with the same. And exactly the similar the same kind of transitions happen in the backward direction with rate QK. So we have PKs and QKs, and uh, this process is invariant under horizontal translations. And so one can focus on configurations where the one one con location is occupied by a first class particle. And these are restricted configurations, and then the column indices must be strictly increasing. So, for example, if you have four L equals four N equals two, these are the kinds of configurations. The one one position is always first. Okay, so this this process lumps to the disorder the disordered PACEP studied by Martin Evans uh, in a probabilistic sense. Okay, so that's the reason why this makes. Okay, so uh, since I don't have much time, I will not go through all the details. One can show that this process is irreducible. It's not obvious at all. But one can go from any configuration, any such configuration to any other configuration. And therefore, the stationary distribution is unique. Now, uh, it's a, the, the slides are online, so you can look at the details if you're interested. But just to, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I want, to say that there is a weight associated to every column. So for a given configuration, I, there's a certain weight associated to the column. And the weight of the configuration is the product of the column weights. And the stationary distribution is precisely this. So that's our main theorem for the stationary distribution. So this is completely disordered. We have no, we do not specify any values of the PIs and the QJs. For example, for this configuration, here is this formula. I mean, it, it doesn't look simple, but the nice thing is that it is a monomial. It's nothing more complicated. So it's a single term, uh, which is a product of the P's and the Q's for every such configuration. And our theorem is that this is, this is indeed the stationary distribution. And um, so we, for this, we need all the P's and the Q's to be strictly positive. There is a variant of this where the Q's are zero, but then the analysis is different. And we also get a formula for the partition function, in fact, the generating function of the partition function uh, in terms of uh, product of uh, rational function. So the main thing I want to advertise in this uh, talk is uh, this uh, very funny and interesting behavior for the currents. Okay, so if I, if you remember, so, so the first class particles only move horizontally. So they either go this way or this way. So the kth first class particle will go right with PK and go left with QK. So if you want to talk about the current of first class particles, it only makes sense to talk about the horizontal current. These guys just don't move up and down, so they, they only move right and left. So we can talk about the horizontal current, and here is the formula. Uh, so abstractly, here is the formula. Okay, I, I don't expect you to go through all the details, but uh, you know that's it. But there's a very nice and explicit expression for the partition function. Uh, sorry, for the current of first class particles, this horizontal current. It's the product of the p's minus the product of the q's times the ratio of the. This is very explicit. And very simple. And, but this you can also, because the first class particles do not look at the second class, uh, I mean, one can talk about the same formula directly from Evans and he gets more or less the same answer. What's more interesting is the uh, second class particles. So the second class particles, so let me remind you, go back here to the dynamics. So in this, for this kind of motion, the second class particles are moving horizontally. But for this kind of motion, the second class particles, this, this particular second class particle is also moving vertically. So the second class particle, a given second class particle, if you follow it, sometimes moves horizontally, in which case it's a local motion. It just moves to the next uh, column. Or it moves vertically, in which case it moves a, performs a highly non-local motion. So from here, it went all the way there. So there are two kinds of currents for the for the horizontal uh, for the second class particles. 
So that's what I mentioned here. So the horizontal, in the horizontal direction, the motion is local. And if you calculate the current of that, it turns out to be exactly zero, the stationarity. So everything cancels out and you get exactly zero. None of this is mean field, by the way. Everything is exact. So we can talk about the vertical current. Now this vertical current is not across any edge. It's just from one row to another row. And one can define an upward and a low, uh, a downward current. And uh, so, so it turns out again, you can calculate it exactly. So the upward current is the product of the P's times the ratio of the partition functions. And the downward current is the ratio of the Q's. And so if you take the difference, the net current of the second class particles in the vertical direction is exactly the same as the net current of the first class particles across the horizontal. This is something completely unexpected and, uh, and exact. And if, if I remind you again that the dynamics is controlled completely by the first class particles. So when the, first cl the second class particles move completely at the mercy of the first class particles. So this is what we call the Scott-Russell phenomenon. So uh, let me show you what the Scott-Russell linkage is. So you might have seen this in your engineering courses. So this is a device like this. If you move the, uh, this lower guy horizontally, this, uh, this guy moves vertically. So it's a method for transferring uh, linear motion in one direction to a linear motion in a perpendicular direction. So that's essentially what is happening. The first class particles are moving horizontally and they make the first second class particles move vertically by the exact same amount, stochastically, in a sense. Okay, so this is named after John Russell and its standard piece of equipment. And uh, it's a non-trivial uh, phenomena and his, this guy's other claim is this discovery of solitons. I'm almost done. So uh, yeah, so this is a manifestly two-dimensional non-equilibrium phenomena and uh, we hope to see other manifestations. So thank you for your time. Now we are open for questions. Yes, so he's the guy who discovered soliton. So you have heard the story of him running around down a channel when he saw this, right? that was Scott Russell. Yes? First class and uh, second class particles uh, mean physically, and uh, what was the reason behind the initial set of rules for the dynamics of these two particles? <laughs> well, uh, we were, as I said, we were motivated by Evans' result, and uh, we thought we could understand it uh, better. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a complicated. So, I mean, so we don't know any physical model, physical model, which will do this kind of non-local jump for the second class particle. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would be happy to find one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yes, Kavita. So for the 1D case, uh, I mean, you have a particle-wise disorder. Yes. Right, on a ring. Yes. But you can map it to the zero range process with site-wise disorder where you have product measure. Yes. Right, so that's what is used, I guess, for the... That's how he solves it, yes. Yeah. And then you can sort of use that for the 2D case. Is that the sort of idea going on? Right. So his formula. Uh, in because the, see this ratio of the partition functions, and that's exactly what happens in those yes, yes. models too, right? That's right. Yeah. So uh, what we wanted to do was to give a combinatorial formula for his proof. And that's how we started. And uh, so then we naturally came into this. Uh, two dim First, we formulated it as a multi-species process. And then we realized it can be formulated better as a as a two-dimensional process. So, yeah. No more questions. So, uh, thanks to the speaker. Thank you.